Uh, Soon is loaded after this. What? My slot, my slots. Yes, that's over here. Okay. It's going to be on uh, YouTube. They will yes. see. Yes, okay. Uh, and they will uh, hear your voice okay. during the demonstration of your slides. Okay. And the students can ask questions or just Perfect. in the chat. And uh, you will judge or moderate. And uh, uh, our students will ask you uh, uh, questions here. Yeah, I think I have them already to ask some questions. I think I can see that most of those are two. Well, that's just like the uh, PR industry in the US. Yeah, yeah. and in Russia also. Yeah, like 80% probably. Mm -hmm. You know, women are stronger. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, you are yes. used to be a, to both strong people, and uh, women are stronger than men. You are so fragile. You are so fragile. That, that is that, me. I'm okay, afraid. it's 12. Let us start. Please use it. Я думаю, включу микрофон. Дорогие друзья, дорогие слушатели, которые к нам присоединились онлайн, дорогой друг и мой коллега, Монти Хаглер, которого мы сегодня здесь встречаем. Я очень рада его представить. Это Монти Хаглер – основатель и CEO, президент своей компании пиар-агентства. Он также является председателем комитета глобальной ассоциации пиар-агентств региона Северной Америка WorldCom PR Group. До этого, до того, как его избрали председателем глобального совета, мы вместе с Монти возглавляли я в Европе, Монти в Северной Америке, комитеты по аудиту пиар-агентству каждого из регионов. Я думаю, что сегодня будет очень интересно узнать, как меняются коммуникации, цифровую эру, что изменилось от традиций, от традиционных к, к цифровым. Для Монти я скажу коротко сейчас на английском языке, чтобы он понимал, о чем мы говорили, и дальше я передам ему слово. Монти, uh, I just introduced you as my partner, as my friend, as a founder and CEO of RLF Communication, and as a chair of the north region of the WorldCom PR group and uh, before becoming a, a chair of the uh, north, uh, re north American region of PR group, uh, you and me, we both were chairs of auditing of PR agencies in our regions, me and EMEA, you are in North, you are in America because It was the joint uh, region. Now it's uh, separated to uh, Latin America and North America. And uh, I just said that it would be very interesting to know PR communication, how communication in general changed in the, uh, uh, these circumstances in the uh, digital era. And what we need to know now, how we should switch from traditional to digital um, communication or we need to combine these two traditions um, we know that uh, before 
We needed to be very concentrated on big tests, press releases, uh, to edit it. Now we need to be very rapid, very quickly uh, prepared to, um, to make this kind of communication. I would like you to share with us North American tradition. We know that technologies are coming from North America, but they uh, uh, become advanced in the other world and uh, please share with students your opinion. Hello, is this on? Uh, I'm so sorry. I, I need also just to invite uh, Georgi, who will help you to receive questions. And uh, will you please then answer questions from online attendees and the students who attend this one? Please. Yes. I'm delighted to be here, and you have a beautiful city. This is my first time in Moscow, and I have enjoyed it very much. And I want to thank Victoria, my host, for shepherd, shepherding me around the city. So what I thought I would do is talk about how we are approaching public relations in the United States and the different sectors, the way we look at what we do, um, how public relations, I'm going to talk about public relations as opposed to marketing or advertising. They are all interrelated disciplines, but they are different disciplines. So we can talk about that as well. So uh, this is my company. Now, here's the clicker. Good. Which way do I go with that? So my company is called RLF Communications. Um, I started my career working for a banking corporation doing communications. I wrote speeches. I did news releases. I did merger and acquisition communications. And then I switched a long time ago to the agency side. So I didn't work for one company. I worked for an agency and had many different clients. So I've learned a lot about many different industries. And I think that's one of the best things about public relations. You get to learn a lot about a lot of different subjects. So our agency, this is Ralph. He's our mascot at our company. He's our idea monger. And uh, you know, we serve, we're based in North Carolina, but our clients are located across the United States. And the work that we do is pitching stories and, and helping our, company, our clients communicate throughout the United States and Canada primarily. Um, and what we say we do is we build and tell stories that engage the audiences that are important to our clients. So we help them figure out how to tell their story and uh, get attention and get traction. And I think we're very good at generating creative ideas and then putting those ideas into strategies to achieve our clients' objectives. So it's not just about writing something down, it's about coming up with something uh, creative to break through the clutter. And so a lot of what we do, though, is still about executing uh, very responsive, very personal touch. It, this is a person-to-person -person business. We can talk about technology, but at the end of the day, it's about building relationships. So again, we say we cut through clutter, we diminish uncertainty, and we you know, simplify the complex. We take all of this information and figure out what's important. And I, you know, we, we, we have clients who will allow us to do great work in partnership with them. So we've been fortunate over the course of the 15, 14 years that we've had an agency to uh, be recognized for a lot of work and that work that has generated results. So I'm very proud of our team and, and the work that we do together. And then we have a lot of different clients and I won't go into all of these, but you know, from banks to universities, to uh, West Marine, which makes boat supply, sells boat supplies. So we have a very diverse client base. And again, I think that's one of the things in our industry. Uh, you can specialize. You can just do healthcare, or you could just do financial services. We are much more of a generalist agency. I literally learn something new every day. And I like that about my job. So how do I define public relations? I define public relations 
you know, as managing and promoting communications between organizations and key stakeholders. And key stakeholders are the groups who can help you or hurt you based on what they think, what they believe, what they say, and they do. So it's not everybody. It's who are the audiences that are most important to what my organization is trying to achieve. And in order to succeed, you know, we have to identify the right channels to connect with those stakeholders. And so the way, we've, the way we're, we're looking at it is, is called PESO. And PESO was really developed, uh, that term was coined by a woman named Jenny Dietrich, who's a PR professional in the United States. And so think of it this way, PESO stands for paid, earned, shared, and owned. And I'm gonna walk through these because it's a combination then of traditional ways of communicating and emerging digital tools. So let's just walk through that and I'll give you some examples of each one. So paid, paid in some ways is the easiest, right? You pay to deliver your message and you can you can determine what you're going to communicate how often you're going to communicate the medium it's going to show up in so you know that's that's out of home so think billboards or signage on the side of a of a car that's called out of home you know radio television print digital ads that that show up you're buying that you're writing the content and you're figuring out when it's going to be delivered. But there's some interesting ways that you can now do um, paid, not just an ad, like a static ad. So one of the cool things, and y'all may do this here, is called geofencing. Are y'all familiar with geofencing? So geofencing is where you pick a target. Um, let's say a sports arena that there's going to be a big soccer soccer match or football match you encircle the stadium with a digital signal so that everybody who goes in and they use their phone right you use your phone to okay, i do not want to lose my passport um you use your phone while you're at this at the football match you post something on social media you send you connect to the internet you send an email well, when you do that, if we've geofenced it, we have captured your mobile device. And then for the next 30 days or 60 days, I can deliver ads to you on whatever subject I'm trying to promote. So that's very important because you can target. You know that if people go to a certain concert, they fit a certain demographic group, and you can tailor your messages to that. So we're using geofencing right now. We're promoting an early childhood program, trying to help new parents become you know, more engaged with their, with their children. So we have encircled, we have geofenced the hospital where all the births take place. So if you really wanna target parents with new babies, there's no better way to do it than to geofence the hospital where they have to go to have the baby. So that is called geofencing, and it's, it's a, a paid way of targeting your advertising. Not possible a few years ago. Um, Over-the-top advertising. So in the United States, traditionally, you watch television, you know, streamed over the air or through cable. You were connected. And now, more and more people, probably none of you are connected to cable, right? You are streaming shows through your phone. Well, that's a problem for advertisers and for people who want to reach you because how do I reach you? I can't you know, get you through cable. So now it's called over the top. And that is you're about to stream something and it stops because there's a short ad, 10 second or 15 second, and you have to watch that ad before you can continue to watch your show. That's called over the top. So Hulu, Roku, any of these streaming services we have the ability to plug into what you are watching, and we know based on the show you fit a certain demographic, and stream our ad, and then you can proceed to watch the rest of it. Very new, very emerging technology, but if you want to reach young people, that's the only way to do it. You can even do it in video games. If, if you're playing a video game and your video game gets stopped for a short ad, I do that. 
Why? Because you're, you're getting it for free and nothing is free. So that was paid. So earned, earned is traditional. Earned is traditional, you know, uh, public relations. That is media relations. That is news releases. That is thought leadership. And so there's, you know, editorial calendars. Well, we'll we will look and see a publication is going to be writing about this issue in six months. We want to have one of our clients write an opinion piece and pitch it, you know, to help uh, influence how that issue should be should be perceived. Um, Harrow and editorial calendars. So these are all the traditional tools. And when we do media relations, we divide that up in many different ways. We have databases. So I could tell you, um, I, was, I was speaking with someone earlier about cryptocurrency. So I can go into a database and generate a list of all the journalists who have written about cryptocurrency, you know, from national publications like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times to regional publications, to magazines, bloggers. And so we'll develop this list of 150 journalists. And then we can target pitches and say, I know you write about cryptocurrency. We have a client who's doing something very innovative in this space, and I would like to connect them with you. So that is how we approach media relations. And so ProfNet and Harrow are two services where journalists post queries and they say, I'm working on a story about cryptocurrency. I need to find an expert who's doing cryptocurrency and blockchain technology in the art sector. Okay, that's a very specific ask. So we have our team is constantly every day looking at these queries because they post them maybe four times a day. And we read that and we go, oh my gosh, we have a client that does that we need to respond and position our client with them. So it's not, again, trying to target the world. It's trying to find the right people with the right message at the right time. So we use Hero and ProfNet uh, for those to help us with that. So shared. So shared is social media. It's Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and all these emerging channels. And why is it shared? Well, it's shared because you can create content and post it, but then it's live in the world and people can comment on it, right? They don't always have to like it. They can share it themselves. They can post stuff back to you. So it is a very much an interactive. And so clients struggle with that. They think, oh, it's free. Twitter is free, Facebook is free, right? Well, no, it's not free. First of all, it, YouTube is free. It takes a lot of work and a lot of creativity to come up with things that will cut through the clutter and get people to pay attention to it, right? I, I'm not sure what the latest statistics are, but there are millions of videos uploaded to YouTube every day, right? Your, the video you post does not suddenly become viral and everybody in the world sees it. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to figure out how to target online content and get people to pay attention to it. When you think about all the information you process in a day, how do you get people to stop for 15 seconds and pay attention to your message and interact with it? And how do you do it in a way that you feel comfortable that people may not use it the way you intended. They may view it a different way and have a different response. So shared audiences outside of an organization's control are an active participant in it. It's very powerful, but it's not like paid, right, where you can control it. You have to be willing to share and engage and see where it leads you. And if you're a smart organization, you'll take that feedback and learn from it. You won't get upset, well, you might get upset, but you will learn from it and adapt and become better. So shared is a very important mechanism. And again, it takes a lot of work to create good content. So we do social media for some clients. 
you know, uh, we create YouTube videos, we, we, we create content for Facebook, um, we, you know, we do a lot of different stuff. So this is, um, this is our early childhood education, right? We post, we create content for families and we want them to read it and share it and be more engaged in their child's development. So we have a lot of fun with that. And then finally there is owned. And owned is you know, where you are controlling those channels, but you're not paying necessarily. This forum by your university is a great example of an owned channel. You have created this symposium. You have invited in these speakers. You have invited in the media. You, you own it, but it's participatory. There's lots of different people here. So you're using it for thought leadership. You're using it to advance and build your brand. There's lots of ways to do that. You can do promotions, uh, positioning people on panels, right? Writing a speech, getting on a panel where you're perceived as an expert. That is owned. Creating collateral, creating an intranet, your own website. You, get, you control the content on your own website, but you have to make it engaging for people to come and want to use that content and share that content. So we still create a lot of collateral. And I know that you, know, you think everything is online and digital. That's true, but people still want to hold, hold things, touch things. We create collateral brochures. So we do think everything we do now has both an online component, a digital brochure, but many of them still have a hard brochure. You may only print 50 of them, but the 50 people who want the hard copy tend to be important people, you know? So, so we develop collateral and, you know, a campaign, if you're creating a campaign, it can use some of those channels. It can use all of those channels. Our job as strategists is to figure out what is the right way to reach the right people to advance our organization's interests. And if we need all of them, we need all of them. If we only need a few, we only need a few. And a lot of times it's dependent upon the client's budget. If the client says, I want to do all of this, but their budget is this, you say, you can't do that. So we have to help you figure out how to make the best use of your resources. And it's not just money, it's time, it's energy, and it's money. All those things go together. So I am happy to answer any questions. Yes. So the middle part of that is the professional reputation of a PR. Yes. Oh. I think if you're not willing to constantly learn, um, you know, what I tell people is this, you will be very successful in this business if you can do three things. Can you write? Okay. Can you take a whole, you know, bunch of information and figure out what's important and write it? Because whether you're writing a news, you know, a news release, a blog post, a speech, a caption, the header of an email, you have to be able to write. So that's the first criteria. Can you think, can, as I said, can you take a whole bunch of information and figure out what's important and pull it, you know, pull it out? And the third thing is, can you manage multiple projects at once? So if you were a person who likes to say, give me a task, let me finish that task, and then I will move on to the next thing, you will not make it in this business. You have to be able, if you're in an agency, you have to be able to be working on a client that's a bank, and you're in a meeting, and you're talking about that bank and what they're trying to achieve. And then you're going to get out of that meeting, you're going to go to your desk, and you're going to have a client that works in early childhood education, and you got to change your gear. 
because what people, what's important and how you communicate about early childhood education is very different from how you communicate about a bank. And then can you go into a meeting and talk about a different client and a different issue? And if you can't manage multiple projects, which is different than multitasking, okay, multitasking is juggling, right? Managing multiple projects is putting your brain into what's important to that client and their audiences, and then switching your brain to what's important here. If you can do those three things, you can write, you can think, and you can manage multiple projects, you will do very well in this business. Uh, so unfortunately, there are no questions no in questions. this stream. <laughs> yes. Please. I would love for Russian companies to hire me. So if y'all are watching, I'm available. Uh, we are working currently with uh, a, an agency here that is representing the uh, Russian chairmanship of the Arctic uh, Council. So there are eight countries that share territory in the Arctic Circle. And that organization, there's an organization that they have formed that's been around for 25 years. And every two years, the chairmanship rotates. And the chairmanship is now with, um, with Russia. And so we have been engaged in the United States and Canada to help tell the story about what the Arctic Council is doing, and specifically Russia's leadership of the Arctic Council by engaging in media relations in the United States. So that is, that is our first example. We also, as, as Svetlana said, we're partners in a group called WorldCom. That is 100 independent agencies around the world that we can call on if we have a client that has a need in Russia or vice versa. And we share knowledge, uh, we share resources, we share best practices, and we build relationships so that when our clients have a need somewhere, it's not just a dot on a map. I know my partners, that's why I meet with my partners and I have traveled around the world so that there is a level of trust, a level of respect, so that we are able to know that our clients will be in good hands when we say, you should work with this agency in this market. Uh, so thank you. If it's possible, I would like to ask you yes. some questions. Uh, which social network, worldwide social network, uh, is the most at uh, heavy? What do you mean by heavy? Uh, a, a lot of uh, advertising in oh. social networks facebook twitter yes uh not so much twitter uh facebook uh youtube again a lot a lot of what is being done is not about just advertising to you it's about companies buying your data okay and figuring out then how to use that data to market to you in other ways so we are constantly looking at how are people utilizing YouTube or Instagram? What content are they gravitating towards? And how do we take that and then use it for our clients to market? But it all, you know, it all depends. LinkedIn is great if you're business to business, right? You don't use LinkedIn for business to consumer needs. You use LinkedIn for business to business. You use Instagram very differently from how you use Twitter. One of the one of the things we have found with Twitter is so journalists are on Twitter, right? They are they are posting comments, they're following these issues, and so you can if you start following those journalists on Twitter, a you have a much better understanding of what's important to them, how do they like to receive information, what do they write about, and you can engage with them in a way that you they don't respond to an email. Okay, they don't respond to a phone call. Like some journalists have voicemail messages say, do not leave me a message, <laughs> okay? But they will engage in Twitter. They will engage in other online platforms. So a lot of this is about figuring out who is your audience and how do I reach them? Okay, thank you. Uh, my friend who uh, watching the stream uh, asked, asked you, uh, in your opinion, what are the prospects for television when we all live in the area of the development of internet information? Well, if we, if we define television broadly, I think 
the prospects have never been better. I mean, when you think about the number of channels that have proliferated, and I mean, is, net, is Netflix television or internet? It's both, right? It is a visual medium that is producing content. Uh, Hulu is producing content. So I, I define them as sort of it's, it's merging together. And, you know, it's not just in the United States three television channels anymore or X number of cable. The proliferation of visual assets is huge. I mean, we have more entertainment than we can keep up with. We were talking about last night at dinner. There is probably more quality television and movies and series than ever before. And it's because there is more competition, but not just more competition, there's more outlets for creativity. And I come back to the point of it makes it harder in some ways for public relations because everything is becoming more fragmented. There is more and more and more and more. And that becomes harder. Um, so, but I, I believe that there is a bright future for television because there is a bright future for telling stories. And that is what we do. At heart, we are storytellers helping organizations, whether that's a bank or a nonprofit or a government agency, we are helping tell their story in a way that captivates people's interests to then promote understanding and acceptance. Storytelling and television is a huge medium for that. And uh, watch TV programs are most popular in USA. I'm not going to answer that. I'm not a good a good barometer of cultural. Uh, I'm not going to say that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Okay. So the question is how, how to start your own business. So I, I started my career, as I said, working for a banking corporation and getting experience. And then I, and I was working for a very large bank, um, very big. And, you know, and I moved after five years to a very small agency, like five people. My mother was not happy. You know, I was, I was a vice president for this bank. She could tell everybody, oh, he works for this company. And then I left and I joined this very small company. But we grew that from five people to about 65 people while I was there. And then I had a chance to go work for an advertising agency and I wanted to learn the advertising side of the business. And they were like 100 people. So I, I went uh, to, I moved. I moved my family. Um, my daughters were like two and one and we moved about an hour. And I did that for three years. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about advertising as well as public relations. And while we were successful, what I found was I had a very different vision for how an agency should be run from the other partners. They viewed the world like this, and I viewed the world like this. And so I decided that if I viewed the world like this, then I should quit talking about it, and I should do something. So I quit and I started my own agency. And what I would tell you is, if you have that desire, you should do it. And you should probably do it earlier rather than later. I wish that I had done it sooner, but I, got, I, I had all the experience I needed to then do that. And there will always be challenges, right? So our first year in business was still our best year ever. We tunned it. We made a lot of money. We had a lot of fun. And that was 2007. And uh, I had borrowed money because I, I, I bought my way out. And then most of you are too young to remember, but in 2008, there was a great recession where the economy in the United States and across the world, it was like literally running into that wall. And that's by far the hardest time I've ever had because I had borrowed money to, to buy my way out. I had a non-compete. And the bank didn't care 
that we lost 50% of our business in a month. The bank was like, you still have to repay us. So it was about buckling down and, and getting through. And you do that because you build good relationships um, with your clients, with your team. And so I would say if you're, you, have, you have to have experience, but not too much experience, right? Because if you have too much experience, it's hard to you get comfortable. You need capital. Okay, you need cash. Um, it is, credit is great, but you need cash, and you need a debt. You know, you need money to do it. So you either have to have that money yourself, or you have to find someone who believes in you and helps you get started. So, but I would say, if you have a desire to do something, if you have a dream, if you have a vision for something, do it. Don't wait twenty years and then say, "I wish that I had done this." Great advices. <laughs> uh, any question, please? Uh, I will call it if um, we uh, thought uh, from the perspective of old school PR person and uh, now modern school, modern people. We meet two um, tracks, two ways, facts and emotions. Mm -hmm. And in storytelling, we always have this kind of um, battle between facts and emotions, facts and, po and post-truth. How we should cope with this problem in our profession? Well, I don't know if it's a problem as much as it is a reality that, you know, you, so, so it sounds so simple, facts and emotion. Well, facts are still subjective in the sense of what facts do you believe and I believe. I mean, I think that's one of the big problems we have in society is there are certain things that are truths and yet people do not believe them. There are rumors and myths spread a lot online. And I will use COVID as an example, the vaccine. So in a very short time, scientists and researchers and medical personnel developed vaccines that can help protect us from this terrible virus. And in the United States, that vaccine is available to literally every person. There is no shortage. And we still have 30, 40% of our population that has not taken the vaccine, and many of them not, have not taken it because there are rumors and myths about, oh, it's not safe, and it will do this, and it's a government plot to, you know, inject me with something. It is hard to believe that, but, it, but if we just dismiss it, we miss the point. There is misinformation out there. There is mistrust. And our job is to figure out how to overcome that, how to dispel that, because we need for people to accept that this is something that's good, not only for their individual health, but for the society, for society's health. It allows us to get back to our lives and our economy. So, I mean, I think COVID is a great example of, we have facts. I believe the researchers, right? I am not a medical person, but when I have all of these leading medical people say, this vaccine is safe, this vaccine is the right thing, but yet we still have so many people who don't believe those facts, that is a problem. Uh, what do you think, what uh, advertising is considered effective for young people today? I definitely believe online advertising and not just a straight ad. I think that straight ads, people tune out, get blocked in. So instead, advertising that, that gets people, you know, who opt into things, um, who engage in a contest, engage in an online, you know, eSports. So we've got, we've got this group out here that's got eSports. eSports is one of the fastest growing industries. So not actually out there playing football, but playing football on your couch, inter you know, interacting with people around the world. 
Well, advertisers are, are looking at that going, how do we tap into creating our own online sports teams, <laughs> right? And so you think of a sport, uh, you know, a sports team that's being sponsored by somebody. Well, it doesn't have to be a real advertisers are now going in and branding sports teams and getting people to play for that team. So I think it is about finding out how to figure out where young people are, how they are interacting and using social media and how to inject their brands into those platforms. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Well, thank you all for the opportunity to come and, and speak with you today. So, um, are y'all, who is a communication major? I know I've spoken to people that have different majors here, uh, international management and policy. Are there anybody that's a true just communications PR major? Yes? Okay, good. good. Very active well, students. <laughs> And I would say there are, you know, there, this is an industry that is not going to go away. Every organization, every government agency, every nonprofit, every environmental group needs people with the skills that you are developing. So it, it, is, a, it is a very interesting time. The channels are changing of how we communicate, but again, the core skills of what we do are not going away. So I think there's a bright future for you moving ahead. Okay. Thank you.